can't see the word just looking at what I'm putting on the phone. Power in his blood. There's power in the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm Dr. Michael P. Williams, senior pastor of the Genesis Church. We thank you for joining us today for this wonderful, wonderful Good Friday. Now, only believers can call this to be Good Friday. And if you joined in, you heard that powerful song from our uh, worship pastor, pastor of worship and arts and media at the Genesis Church, Glenda Taylor, national recording artist and uh, who has been a faithful psalmist and servant in our ministry for so many years. And we thank God for that. She's my favorite gospel singer because I know her. She's a supporter and a, and a giver and an encourager. And what an awesome talent. There's power in the blood of Jesus. We're here on Good Friday and I know this is a uh, once again, an unusual and awesome kind of experience for us using this medium to try to reach you, but this is what we've got to do. Let's not be discouraged. Let's not be discouraged. The early Christians met in homes, and uh, when they found themselves under persecution from their enemies, they went underground. They went into caves, they went into catacombs, and uh, they worshiped, and their worship was powerful, uh, it was impacting, and the church grew by leaps and bounds, not just in power and numbers, but in the influence that it had with the unbelievers around them. And I believe that this is going to be, God is not the author of confusion, but God will use this, not only for his glory, but to advance his kingdom. And so it's been it's been many years since I've, I've preached a Good Friday message, because it has always been our uh, custom to have a Good Friday service at 12 noon and to invite uh, a guest sometime out of town, sometime in town, to come and share and preach. So it's been a good many years that I have shared, but the Lord has given me a word for today, and I hope the Genesis family in particular is joining in, but all of us who are here together, I want to thank uh, uh, the technology that is helping us. We're trying to fix some things and do some things. And so if it looks a little jagged from moments, just because we're getting things in order and uh, trying some new technologies and we hope that it's, uh, it's welcome, that's good. I hope it's working well for us. Uh, I want you to, if you have your Bibles with you, and I believe you do, uh, you may have the book or you may have um, some electronic device that has the word of God in it. Uh, I am preaching from the New International Version and so if you can go to that particular translation, if you can't, uh, don't worry. Just use the translation that you have and the word of God will come through with clarity and power. Uh, I want you to turn in your Bible to the first letter uh, from Paul to the church at Corinth, the first Corinthian epistle. An epistle is a letter, the letter that Paul wrote there, the first chapter and the 18th verse. Before we do that, let's make our confession. This is my Bible, God's holy word. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I'm going where it says I'm going. The grass may wither, the flower may fade, heaven and earth may pass away, but the word of God will stand forever. I am standing on the living word of God Amen, amen. That's what we confess at the Genesis Church before the word of God is preached. 
So I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 1.18 in the New International Version. And it reads this way. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I want to read it again. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The King James says, for the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that are perishing. But this is what it says, for the message of the cross, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And that's what I want to share with you on this Good Friday, the message of the cross, the message of the cross. Beloved, we live in an age where the meaning of the cross has uh, too often been minimized, ignored, or often forgotten. Remember, we live in an age where the meaning of the cross has too often been minimized, ignored, or forgotten. Uh, there are even churches, um, very popular churches, churches that are full of people, that will not display the cross uh, because the Bible makes it clear that the cross is an offense. Uh, to the Jews, it is an offense. To the Greeks, it is a stumbling block. It is, it is an offense to religion, and it is a stumbling block to reason, to those who simply want to rely on human knowledge, human creativity, human understanding. And, and, and what we see in our culture today is that the cross has become a fashion accessory. We see people wearing their cross rather than bearing their cross. Jesus said, if you would follow me, let you take up your cross and follow me. But the cross has just become a fashion accessory and worn by those who have no connection to its memory, to its meaning, or to its magnitude. But we as Christians should never forget that the cross is saying something. The cross is a message. God is speaking to us through the cross. Uh, I like to describe it this way, that the cross is not an ornament, it's an oracle. That word oracle in the ancient world, the oracle was where humanity and divinity met and where men sought to hear the voices of their gods. Uh, the cross is an oracle. I describe it as an oracle because through the cross, God is speaking to us. Uh, to this day, 2,000 years later, God is speaking through the cross. Whenever you see the cross, if you are a believer, it should be saying some things to you. Now, when the world sees the cross, I can't always uh, understand or acknowledge what the world sees. I know they, they understand it to be... Uh, uh, the emblem, the symbol of the Christian faith. But uh, the, the cross is more than symbol. The cross is sign. It's pointing to something. And so what is the message that the cross is pointing to? Well, the first thing that it's doing is that the cross is saying that the world perceives the things of God to be foolishness. The cross is foolishness to the world. The Bible says clearly that to the natural man, there are only three levels. You're either natural or carnal or spiritual. That the natural man perceives the things of God to be foolishness. The carnal man or woman is a combination between the natural and the spiritual. So therefore, the carnal person, sometimes they're connected to the things of God, sometimes they're not. But the spiritual person gets the message, understands that the cross to the world is foolishness. It is incomprehensible. And that's why the Bible says that, that the cross, the preaching of the cross, the message of the cross to the Greeks who represented intellect and reason. And, and, and that is what the whole world, the world goes with things that your five senses can understand or goes with things that are factual in that sense that are factual, that it is, it is a stumbling block. It's an offense to them. It's both. That, that, that the world sees the things of God as being foolish. 
And the cross represents that. It is incomprehensible that God would wrap himself in human flesh and come to die. Uh, it was not uncommon in the religions of the ancient world for the gods to come to earth. Uh, the, the Greeks, no self-respecting Greek of the first century with any education and exposure would believe in the Greeks in the Greek gods that we describe as mythology, but at one time was religion. They would not believe in that because their gods were made in the image of man and they would come to earth to do the all do all the things that that men would do in their flesh, in their lust, in their desires. Uh, they were just human beings on, on omnipotent steroids. Uh, but but the, the Jews would not, could not perceive of God wrapping himself, uh, could not perceive of God condescending, of coming down to the place of man. And that is the great scandal of the Christian faith that God wrapped himself in flesh and came to die, that he was born to die. And this ultimate sacrifice is alien to the world's thinking. It's foolishness. And not only is it alien to the world's thinking, it is rare in practice. Uh, rarely do we see a man who would give his life for another man. Uh, rarely is that practicing. We elevate them to heroic status when they put themselves out on the line for somebody else. But God put himself, wrapped himself in flesh. Paul says in Philippians that he emptied himself and came in the form and appearance of a man. He laid down his divinity and picked up his humanity and came to sit where we sit and become a, a death eligible that he put himself in a position, God would put himself in a position that evil could take hold of him in the flesh, brutalize him and nail him to a cross. To the world, this is foolishness. And that's what the cross says to us first, that, that it takes spiritual eyes to see the cross. That is why only for believers can Good Friday be good. Uh, Good Friday seemed like the end of everything. It was the end of the hopes and dreams of those who had connected themselves to Jesus and his earthly ministry. It was the end of Jesus's natural life for surely he died on Calvary. Yes, he did. He died. It was no, it was no, it was no uh, hallucination. Uh, he died that the blood was real. The pain was real. The agony was real. They took his dead body down from the cross. And, and only in the perspective of the resurrection can we say Good Friday is good. But the cross represents the foolishness. Say so God is pleased by the foolishness of this message, the foolishness of what is being preached, foolishness by the world standards. For Paul says what is foolish to man is the wisdom of God. So the first thing that the cross says to us is that the cross is foolishness to the world. But then the second thing is that to the saved, the cross is the power of God. It is the power of God. For he says it right here, that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved in the process of being delivered, of being rescued, of being delivered, taken away from those things that would hold us hostage, that would keep us uh, locked into the clutches of Satan and, and the works that he has prepared. I'm telling you right now that, that God has moved in such a way by his power through the cross that we can be saved. He has the power to restore. He has the power to forgive. He has the power to reconcile. But yeah, the world sees the cross and it sees foolishness. But when we see the cross, we see the power of God, as the King James says, unto salvation. The power to forgive our sins, the power to restore our lives, and the power to reconcile us back to him. That's what we see when we see the cross. But the third thing we see is that when we look at the cross, we see that God is no limit in his love. There is no limit to his love. Then John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave 
his only begotten son. There is no limit to God's love. God, God graciously and supernaturally, miraculously gave Abraham and Sarah a child, the child of their old age, not just the child of their old age, but the child of their infirmity. The Bible says that uh, Abraham's body was as good as dead and Sarah had always been barren. But God spoke a word of life and their natural bodies were enhanced and, and the natural processes of reproduction took place as God strengthened them in their old age, in their infirmity. And this child, Isaac, was born literally the apple of his father's eye and not just that, the heir to the covenant that God had made with Abraham. But then one day, God told Abraham to bring Isaac to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. The Bible doesn't give us all the details of the, of the emotional and psychological twist, pretzel that Abraham must have found himself in to obey God, to give up the most precious thing that he had. I don't know where he summoned the faith. I don't know how he did it, but he carried him up to Mount Moriah, you know the story, many of you all do, and laid him there on the altar prepared for the knife to go into him to sacrifice him to God. But as he prepared to do it, an angel came and held his hand and said, this was not God's plan. What God would not allow Abraham to do, he did himself. He would not allow Abraham to, to sacrifice his only son, but God gave his son. I'm telling you that there is no limit to God's love because the Bible says that while we were enemies of God, while we were strangers to God, Christ died for us. That God didn't say God loved the earth, didn't say God loved the planet, God loved the world, all that man had brought together, all that man had created in all of its greatness and its wickedness. God loved it and he gave his son for that. I, I have one son. He, he bears my name. I have one son. I could not stand by and countenance evil men taking hands on him and, and dragging him to the, to the backyard and taking, taking down pieces of wood from the fence and, and making a cross and taking rusty nails and driving them in his hands and in his feet and and, and, and me standing back and watching that and allowing that to happen. Jesus himself said, he said, now, don't, don't, get it, don't get it twisted. I lay down my life. No man takes my life. He said, because I can right now ask my father for 12 legions of angels, 72,000 angels to come and fight on my behalf. But God stood there and watched his only son bleed and die. That is the message that there is no limit to God's love. There's no limit to his forgiveness. There's no limit to his grace. There's no limit to his care. For, for Paul picks up that theme in Romans. They said, now, if he would freely give up his own son for us, how then he would not freely give us all things? How could God deny us healing and blessing and prosperity? How could he deny us his care? He's already proven God doesn't have anything else to prove to us because Good Friday proves that with God, there is no limit to his love. No limit. There is a message in the cross. For there is power, power in the message of the cross. And there's power in the message of the cross because there's power in the blood of Jesus. Yeah, I know that's old fashioned. I know that's old church. I know that's old timey, but I still believe it. There is power in the blood of Jesus. Would you be saved? Would you be healed? There's power in the blood, power in the blood of Jesus, power to heal, power to deliver, power to save, power to overcome the works of the devil, wonder working power in the blood of Jesus. There's power in the blood. The blood still works. After 2,000 years, the blood still works. If the blood of a lamb, even though the lamb was without spot or blemish, they took the blood of the lamb and they put that blood over the doorpost and the lentils and the angel of death passed over. 
If there's power in that lamb, there's certainly power in the lamb of God. There's power in the blood of Jesus. Somebody ought to hear me today. Wherever you are, you can say it. There's power in the blood of Jesus. You can lift your hands and thank God that there's power in the blood of Jesus. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein and sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief Rejoice to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, lose all my guilty stains. There's power in the blood of Jesus. Saving power, healing power in the blood of Jesus. There is a message in the cross. And that message is clear to us who are being saved. To the world, it is foolishness. But it's to us, it is the power of God, for there is no limit. I tell you, no limit. I tell you, no limit. There is no limit to his love, no limit to his care, no limit to his grace, no limit to his power. Power in the blood of Jesus. I'm out of my pulpit. I'm sitting in a foreign place to preach the gospel. But if it's real, you can preach it anywhere. If the song is real, you can sing it anywhere. If the prayer is real, you can pray it anywhere. And I'm telling you, this is real because I know there's power in the blood of Jesus. Healing power in his blood. Saving power in his blood. Delivering power in his blood. Wonder working power in the blood of Jesus. There's power in the blood of Jesus. That's why I can call this Friday Good Friday. I love you, beloved. And I thank God that even in this remote and somewhat artificial way, I hope you can feel my passion today that there is truly power in the message of the cross. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those that are dying, but to those of us who are being saved, delivered, it is the power of God. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you Easter Sunday morning. Oh, even though we can't be in the building together, I'm going to be preaching at 1015 on Easter Sunday about the glorious resurrection because this resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ makes Good Friday good. God bless you and we love you.